To show vertical asymptote, you only need to show one limit, or a limit from one of the sides goes to either positive or negative infinity. And it's almost always easier to go from the positive side. So I recommend that one of these two. So limit uh, as it approaches A from the right side. So these are easier, usually a little easier. So we're going to go for A from the positive side just because they're a little easier. So our first problem, we'll do a nice polynomial or a rational function, R of X. x squared minus 4 times x plus 1 in the numerator divided by x squared minus 3x plus 2. So I'm not going to do end behavior, horizontal asymptotes. Those are very different. You get to throw away all the small terms. So if you did, if, if we were going for end behavior, what I could throw away is that minus 4 to the plus 1 and all that stuff right there. So it basic end behavior would look like x cubed over x squared. So I'm not going to do end behavior. We did that before. So I'm going to go just for vertical asymptotes now. But that would be end behavior. I could ignore all those terms I circled. Uh, you don't want to ignore the whole x plus 1 because you'll lose a degree in the numerator. How do I even get started? I need, I need to pick some a values. You don't want to just pick them arbitrarily. Try like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and maybe some negative ones. How can I start picking A values? Factor and eliminate. So we'll factor. At least narrow it down. Yeah, so let's factor our denominator. And I can factor the numerator as well. It's partially factored, but not fully factored. So factor out numerator, denominator all the way right now. So what are the two x values we should try? One and two. One and two. That's what makes me divide by zero. Everything else is, doesn't even have a chance, because the denominator is not going to be zero. So I've got no chance at vertical asymptotes for any other values. So let's try one. So we're only looking for verticals, so we're going to try x equals one. I only have to approach on one side. So we're going to go one from the right side. So if I cancel out x minus 2, x minus 2, what is the only x value that I'm not allowed to can cancel those out for? Yeah. 2. I can't cancel them out if x is 2. So here x is approaching 1 from the positive side. So if I draw a little number line, here is 1. We're approaching 1 from the right side. Well, 2 is pretty far away from 1 as far as the limit's concerned. So I don't really care what's happening distance 1 away. I want to look really close to 1. So the fact that x is 2, um, I can't cancel this. That's OK. I'm close to 1. And I can be very close to 1. So I don't really care what's happening at 2. That doesn't affect the limit at 1. So that's how I'm allowed to just cancel them out. And what do we have left? We just got, ooh, not x squared, x plus 
All right, we're going to plug in 1 everywhere. So I'm going to apply the limit now, so I won't keep writing lim this time. I'm going to actually apply the limit. So we get 1 plus 2, 1 plus 1 over. Now on the bottom, this is a little bit tricky. X approaches 1 on the positive side. I drew a nice little picture right here. X is bigger than 1, approaching 1 on the positive side. So that means x is greater than 1. And I want to solve this for x minus 1. So that means x minus 1 is greater than 0, or positive. So x minus 1, yes, is 0. It's going towards 0. But it's going towards 0 right here in a positive way. That's exactly what we're going to write, yeah. I'm just showing you why, why that is happening using the uh, number line inequality. All right, so x minus 1 is positive. So yes, the limit is 0, but it is positive 0. So it's going to be 0 from the positive side. So if we look, we got a number over. So the number is going to be, we got. 3 times 2, we got basically 6 over a small positive number. So is that positive infinity or negative infinity? Positive. So it'll be positive infinity, because we got positive divided by positive. So the whole thing's going to be positive, but it's going to get very big. So we get positive infinity. That is enough to show this is a vertical asymptote right here. So we can now say uh, r of x has a vertical asymptote at x equals something 1. All right, so we got a vertical asymptote at x equals 1 because we took a limit and said if you approach 1 on the positive side, you're going to positive infinity. I guess sketch a tiny part of this graph. Uh, here's one vertical asymptote, positive side. It's going to be towards positive infinity. I don't know really anything else about the graph, so I can't draw. Just from this information, I can't draw anything else about the graph. I could take a limit on the other side and figure out positive or negative infinity. If you took pre-calculus 1, you could look at the power of that and say, oh, that's degree 1. It's odd. So it'll approach the asymptote on the opposite side, right there. Or you can use calculus and take a limit as we approach uh, 1 from the negative side. And you'll get negative infinity. So let's go ahead and do that computation. It's not necessary to show vertical asymptote, but, but I'm just going to do it for completeness so we can see that we get a different uh, thing on both sides. So it's unnecessary uh, to show vertical asymptote at 1, but we're still going to take it for a learning purpose here. Lim x approaches 1 from the negative side, r of x. I'm going to use a simplified version that already canceled out. So we get x plus 2, x plus 1 over x minus 1. Now we approach 1 from the negative side. Here's 1. We're approaching from the left, so that means x is less than 1. That's what it means to approach from the negative side or the smaller side. So I'm going to solve this for x minus 1. So I'm just going to do the same thing, subtract 1 from both sides, x minus 1 less than 0. So we approach on this side, x minus 1 is going to be negative. So we're going to use that fact over here. And we're going to apply the limit, so don't write limit. So we got 1 plus 2, 1 plus 1, divided by 0. But we know x minus 1, yes, it goes to 0, 
but it goes there in a negative way. So it's going to approach 0 from the negative side. So I'm going to put 0 with a minus right there. So we're going to get 6, same numerator, over. Now we have positive 6 divided by a small negative number. So it's going to be a really big negative value this time, not a, a positive value. So we're going to get negative infinity for our limit. So if we approach on the left side, we're going to get negative infinity. And that would correspond to our vertical asymptote approaching on the bottom on that side. So any questions on either positive or negative side and how we got positive or negative infinity? I'm not sure what you're asking. In this case, we're dividing by 0 from the negative side. However, is, it, is this only the limits period, or will only the limits go to infinity? So and you had to solve for h limits. h is on the denominator. Ah, so if this was 0 over 0, I'd have to do some more algebra. Okay. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what we're about to see in a minute, because we're about to go for 2. And we're going to see that that's going to cancel out and give us a number. So it won't be a vertical asymptote. All right, so we've got a vertical asymptote. Uh, and we're going to look, we're going to try the other value, which is 2, that looks like we'd be divided by 0 also. So we're going to try x equals 2 now. I'm just going to go for the positive side this time, not from both sides. Lim x approaches 2 from the positive side. R of x equals lim x approaches 2 positive side. And there's another x minus 2, x minus 2. So why am I allowed this time to cancel x minus 2? So x approaches 2 from the positive side. Here's 2. x approaching positive side. Does x equal 2 in the limit? Sure doesn't. It's close to 2, but it doesn't equal 2. So I could write 2 less than x. So the point is, x is not 2. x is going to be a little bit greater than 2. Just a tiny bit, but still not equal to 2. So that's what lets me cancel out x minus 2 in the limit right here. Uh, this limit's actually super easy now. Once I got rid of x minus 2s, everything is number, number, number. So I get 2 plus 2, 2 plus 1 over 2 minus 1 which is 4 times 3 over 1, which is 12. And 12 is definitely not infinity or negative infinity. So we do not have vertical asymptote. That is not plus or minus infinity, so we do not have Now, to be fully correct with my definition, I'd have to check both sides. But looking at this, did it actually matter that I approached 2 on the positive side for all the work that I just did? No. Sure didn't. So why don't we just go ahead and take that out? I didn't need to approach from any side in particular. And both sides, I'm going to get 12. So neither side is going to go to infinity. It's going to go to 12. Now I can draw part of the graph here. At 2, I'm up at 12. I don't know what's happening around there, but certainly the function exists around there. There's just a hole in the function at 12. I, I can't plug in tw uh, 2, but I can plug in values right next to 2. And my function will be very close to 12 on both sides. So this is what that graph will look like right around that point. There'll be a hole in it, and then the graph will look nice around it. 
Now I had that vertical asymptote we said at one. You can draw a little more of the graph, but I don't really care for this. I just wanted to talk about right very close to two. There's just a hole in the graph, not a vertical asymptote. So because I am mean and evil, I will probably ask you a question that may look like this, and it looks like there's two vertical asymptotes, but one of them may not be a vertical asymptote. You have to pick which one's going to be, and then you pick one of the two sides, go positive, and tell me, is it plus or minus infinity? All right, questions on this problem here? So next example, I want vertical asymptotes of, let's do f of x is cotangent x. So cotangent. That can be a tr tricky function. Let's write it as cosine and sine. So it should be cosine over sine. When you see it written like this, what is an x value that makes me divide by, by 0? Or is infinite correct answers? Oh, man. Pi is correct? 2 pi is correct? Zero, 0 pi is correct? Every integer multiple of pi works. So you're either at the right or left side of your unit circle when your y is 0. So sine x equals 0 when x equals, so I could write all of them out in this notation, minus pi 0 pi, 2 pi, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the pattern happening right there. It's just all multiples of pi. Uh, a better way to write it out is n pi for all n in the integers. That's a better way to write it out. What's that? You mean if I use the, the like a lowercase z? Or well, you can use any letter you want, I would say, except for x or pi, because we're using x is our variable x, and then pi is the you know constant pi. But I could, I mean, if I wanted to go Greek, I could put an alpha in there. Wherever where it says n, just put an alpha on top and another alpha. You have to tell me where it comes from, though. So it's not all real numbers alpha. It's all integers alpha. Is that, is that your question? Or? I think he meant switching pi, switching n for this. Oh, um, you could write that, uh, but I d don't want you to. So this would mean the set of all integers multiplied by n, which would mean the same thing. What about the set of all integers multiplied by pi? Oh, geez, that should be z pi, not zn. Oh, my goodness. Yes, you could write. I don't want you to do that. No, uh, same thing. <laughs> you could write the word integers for all integers n. That would also work. So you could write for all integers n. So that would work also if you want to keep it English instead of math. All right, so let's go ahead and find some limits. Now this really comes down to knowing what sign is. Pretty much. 
that's the part that's going to be 0. Cosine is either going to be plus or minus 1, depending on if you are at uh, you know, an even or an odd multiple of the pi. So let's just try x approaches 0, positive side of cos x over sine x. Cos 0 is easy. That's 1. I don't need to worry much about that. It's positive 1. Denominator is a different story. Now, do I go plus or minus 1? So before you answer that, you have to know what the sine function looks like. So there's a period of sine. We also want to go, actually, I don't really care about negative side on this particular limit. I just want to go 0 from the positive side. I could draw another period to the left, but for this particular one, I only care about going from the right side. I don't need to worry about going from the left side. I'm doing a right limit. So sine is definitely going towards 0. Is it 0 from the positive side? So think of the y values. Are the y values positive or negative? Positive. It's really easy to see on the sine function. So it's 0 from the positive side. So I'm really using my knowledge of the sine function as opposed to algebra here. Before I used algebra, right here I'm using my knowledge of the sine function to say that it's 0 from the positive side. So we've got 1 over positive 0, which is positive over small positive number, positive infinity. So we'll go for pi next. We'll do limit at pi. And cosine will be 1 again. And then sine, we'll have to be careful with that. But we're going to approach. I'm always going to default to approach from the right side. Just keep it easy. So we got cos pi over, so cos pi is 1 still. Whoa. I should probably put a cosine graph up here too. I'll do it in blue. Yeah, cosine will be negative 1. That makes a very big difference. So cosine, we're down at the bottom, negative 1. So sine, I have to be very careful. Sine approaches pi, or x approaches pi from the right side. Sine is negative now. Sine is approaching 0 from the bottom or the negative side. So we got 0 minus. So we got negative 1 divided by a tiny negative number. Is that plus or minus infinity? Plus infinity. So two negatives divided are going to be positive. So it's going to be positive infinity. I could do the same thing for uh, 2 pi, 3 pi. I can do the same thing in negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi. As long as I'm careful about what value is in the numerator and then what way we're approaching 0 in the denominator. So we get vertical. Ver Let's go vert asymptote at. So we got zero pi. We would keep going, get two pi, and also negatives. So x is n pi for n in the integers. So there's all our vertical asymptotes. So what does a cotangent graph look like? I'm going to do that in pre-calculus class on Monday. So here's our full cotangent graph, not sine or cosine, but actual cotangent. Oh, test your memory. See if you can draw a cotangent, one period of cotangent out. 
give you a hint the period is pi. So there's one period of cotangent right there. Of course, the next period looks like that. And that'll be 2 pi. It crosses the x axis at uh, pi over 2, correct? Uh, yeah, all the pi over 2, and then like 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and all that. So if we look at x equals 0, our vertical asymptote, if we're approaching on the right side, we have positive infinity. If we look at uh, x equals 1 pi, right side, right side is pi or positive infinity also. So every time I approach on the right side, all my vertical asymptotes on the right are positive infinity. If I went on the left, they'd be negative infinity. And I could show it the exact same way I did here, except I'd approach you know, 0 from the negative side instead of the positive side. All right, last problem for asymptotes before we get into derivatives. Limit x approaches infinity of tangent inverse of x. All right, tangent inverse of x is not 1 over tangent. That's called cotangent. So when we write inverse in a function, we mean the inverse or the opposite function. So it's where inputs become outputs and vice versa. So to do this, you have to either remember the graph of tangent inverse or remember the graph of tangent and then how to make it, how to make the graph inverted. So draw one period of tangent and draw the period that uh, you can draw continuously. So our y equals tan x graph So there's one period of tangent I chose this period because if I get, went 0 to regular pi, I'd have two separate pieces of the graph. So this is the uh, restricted domain that we use to make tangent 1 to 1. So we throw out all the other periods. So this is a restricted domain. How do we invert a graph? So there's two ways to do it. We could take the x, y axis and flip them. You can also do that visually by a line y equals x and then a reflection across y equals x. So there's two ways to do it. You can take your x, y axis. I should go like this and then flip them around. So here's your x axis, your y axis, and you flip it around like that. So you can think about doing that. Or you could draw the line y equals x. And I'll do that in blue. And you reflect this image across that line right there. Either way, you'll accomplish the same thing. So we're going to draw the reflected graph now, the inverse. So this will be one way to write this is uh, x equals tangent of y. Or I can move the tangent function to the other side by inverting it. So y equals tangent inverse x. There's two ways to write the same thing. Question? Oh, yeah. So we've got to reflect everything, not just some of the stuff. So everything, including the asymptotes, are going to get reflected. Just one period. Because if I had two periods, I would fail the uh, horizontal line test. And I need to have a one-to-one -one function to invert it, or else my inverse won't be a function. Because my horizontal lines are going to turn to vertical lines. So if I, I fail the horizontal line test, I have two or more points. When I r reflect it, I'll 
not even be a function. So that's why we had to cut off all those other periods. So we have a one-to-one -one function. All right, our inverse graph. Zero, zero is easy to reflect. It goes to zero, zero. And now our asymptotes, you think about these two points right here, they're going to stay where they are. They're not points on the graph, but they're where our asymptotes intersect our reflection line. So our horizontal, our vertical lines reflect to be horizontal. So we're going to have horizontal, horizontal. Now the tricky part, if you're very good at flipping things in your head, you can probably just, if you're a good visual person, you can probably just reflect this in your head. If not, let's look at the top part of the arrow right up here. So that part that I just colored in, when I reflect it, is going to go in that direction, right there. So hopefully you can see that happening right there. When I reflect that arrow that I just shaded in, it's going to turn into that light arrow that I just drew right there. So it's going to show up over here. And when I reflect the bottom part of the arrow, it's going to look like, let's see, about like that right there. So it's going to go mostly to the left. And now we just connect these together with a smooth curve, and it's going to look, oh, <laughs> perfectly like that. And instead of x equals pi over 2, we now have y equals pi over 2, and y equals negative pi over 2. All right, there is our tangent inverse graph. We took our tangent graph and inverted it very carefully. So if you want more help on inverting graphs, my sometime in pre-calculus one, I have notes on that. If you look at my pre-calculus one playlist on YouTube, you can find that. You can also find other people talking about inverting graphs. Let's answer the original question, which was, what was the limit somewhere as x approaches infinity of tangent inverse x? So x going to infinity. So x keeps going all the way to the right. What is y getting close to? Uh, pi over 2. Pi over 2. So it keeps getting closer and closer to pi over 2. So I can write that here. Lim x approaches infinity. Can you do that without inverting, inverting it? Uh, you can. Can you just do the regular and then invert the answer again? So it would be. Well, when you say invert the answer, I think you're talking about reciprocating it. Yeah. So no. This is not a reciprocal, it's an inverse. The reciprocal is inverting multiplication. So if this function was like 3 times x, the inverse would be 1 third x. Because that's a simple multiplication function. But this one's not take x and multiply it. This one's take x and apply the tangent function. All right, I can go to the other side also. We have this nice graph, mine as well. Lim, x approaches negative infinity. What is, we go to negative infinity all the way to the left. Negative pi over 2. It's very easy when you have the graph. Yes, so we can use that property which may be what you vaguely meant. Well, I guess what I meant is like infinity for x becomes infinity for y, or no, infinity for y becomes infinity for x when we invert it, and it's the same, same answer. So let's see if we can do this by using inverse properties without a graph. So I think we all are on the same page with the graph. If you know what the graph looks like, it's not hard to say what the limits are. What is the analogous thing over here? If you knew what the graph of tangent was.
So you could look at the graph. I think probably the best thing to do is look at the tangent graph and say, uh, actually, let me erase this. So y equals tangent inverse of x is the same thing as if I invert the function is tangent of y equals x. So I can move the function to the other side with the inverse function. And from here, so I haven't changed x and y at all. So we don't really want to look at the, the problem with if you look at this graph, this graph is not tangent y equals x. This graph is tangent x equals y. So don't look at the graph at all. That's not going to be helpful right here. So I could write some properties down. I know the vertical asymptotes for tangent. So approach power 2 on the right, we'll get positive infinity here. I think it's going to get a little dangerous if I try to invert the limit. Um, so basically, if I approach y as pi over 2, I will um, tangent goes to positive infinity. It's a little strange because I'm using y's instead of x's here. But we know what the gra graph of tangent looks like. The only weird thing is that's the y-axis now. So if I approach y approaches pi over 2, my x is going to approach positive infinity. And we always do this in the area closest to the origin. Yeah, you always take for tangent, if you're going to invert tangent or cotangent, you always want to take the period that's close to the origin. Cotangent is a little more tricky to do, uh, so I generally won't ask you cotangent inverse. <laughs> 